Thanks to the work of some very fine dramatists, the Netflix adaptation of the series of unfortunate events novels has been absolutely fantastic. A word which here means full of very frightening danger, various fakery disguises and very fitting definitions. Yippee kai movie lovers, I'm Jan and today I'm exploring 12 of the biggest differences between the unfortunate events TV series and the original books. Spoilers ahead for the show and the novels. While the books are rather cryptic about the identity of the taxi driver who offers to take the Baudelaire's away from the Hotel de Numon after Dewey's death by Harpoon, the TV show is much, much clearer. Violet, Klaus and Sonny Baudelaire. My name is Lemony Snicket. In the novels, the children couldn't see the taxi driver's face in the darkness, just the tip of a lit cigarette. Of course, even before season 3, Lemony was already more involved and present in the action of the Netflix series compared to the books. When we hear Uncle Monty tell the children, I promise you, no harm will come to you in the reptile room. We should be on guard for the unpleasant arrival of dramatic irony. But it was great to finally see the Baudelaire's and our narrator meet in the penultimate peril episodes. Frankly, the whole cast has been a joy to watch throughout the series, with Patrick Warburton fantastic as Lemony Snicket, perfectly capturing his deadpan nature. One character who doesn't make it from the books into the TV show is Captain Widdishans. In season 3, we just see a prominently placed portrait of him as well as a photograph belonging to his stepdaughter Fiona, who reveals that Widdishans left one day to answer a distress call from a manatee and never came back. The TV series combines parts of Fiona's character from the Grim Grotto book with aspects of her stepfather's role as captain of the Queequeg. And we do hear Widdishans' voice in the finale, showing that he is indeed still alive. Netflix makes several more changes to the Grim Grotto storyline. For example, Olaf finds the Queequeg earlier in the show than he does in the books, and he forces the Baudelaire's to visit the Gorgonian Grotto, whereas in the books he turns up after the orphans return from the grotto with Fiona, who doesn't accompany them there in the TV show. And in the books, Phil goes missing partway through the story along with Captain Widdishins. The show also reveals how the hook-handed man, aka Fernald, lost both his hands, which isn't confirmed in the novels, though it has been a fan theory. I suspect these various changes were made to condense the action, highlight the Baudelaire's self-reliance by removing an adult guardian figure, as well as give fans some closure on their theories. Because the show's writers wanted Count Olaf to end season 2 and begin season 3 on a triumphant note, they decided to keep his villainous associates alive, even though several of them are killed off earlier in the books. For example, in the novels, the hench person of indeterminate gender is last seen at Heimlich Hospital, where they likely died in the fire and the bald man is eaten alive by lions in the carnivorous carnival book. In the TV show, however, both those hench people are still part of Olaf's troop throughout the Slippery Slope episodes. As for the white-faced woman, on the Netflix series they abandon Olaf's troop after he tells them to throw Sunny off the mountain, as he also did in the 10th novel. However, in a change from the books, the bald man and the hench person of indeterminate gender join the white-faced woman in quitting Olaf's team, and as they leave, they discuss their future plans which involve farming and music halls. And we last see them on stage together at the end of a show they've put on, enjoying the audience's applause. Unlike the members of Olaf's villainous theatre troupe, the carnival freaks last a lot less time in the TV series than they do in the books. In the original stories, Colette, Hugo and Kevin are still alive and kicking, and very much part of Olaf's wicked crew at the Hotel de Numont, and they even provide evidence at Olaf and the Baudelaire's trial, though it's unclear whether they make it out of the hotel fire alive. However, in the TV adaptation, the former carnival employees are bumped off in the Mortmain Mountains by the man with a beard but no hair and the woman with hair but no beard, soon after the start of season 3. I imagine this was done to gradually chip away at Olaf and his schemes, bringing him down from his literal and figurative highest point at the start of the season. And of course, it also gives us an insight into the show's two newest villains. During season 3, we also learn more than we do in the books about Count Olaf's relationship to the man with the beard but no hair and the woman with hair but no beard. When Olaf first sees the ominous duo in the TV show, he calls them Mummy and Daddy. Obviously, we see Olaf's actual father during the opera flashback, so these two terrible people are not his real parents, but rather his figurative parents or mentors who recruited him to their nefarious ranks when he was at a low point in his life after the death of his father. By adding some backstory between these two new characters and Olaf in the show, it gives us some context to what led Olaf down this dark, fire-filled path in life. And it's interesting to see how this man and woman are so much more impressed with Esme, who they've never met before, than they are with Olaf, who's so desperate for their approval. 
The TV series leaves the Quagmires and the Widdershins on a somewhat hopeful note, with the Quagmires reuniting and Fiona and Fernald finding their stepfather Captain Widdershins. However, the books leave us on a much vaguer and less optimistic note when it comes to their fates. In the novels, Quigley does reunite with his siblings and helps them deal with the eagles sent to attack their self-sustaining hot air mobile home. But the birds manage to pop the balloons, sending everyone crashing into the Queequeg below, which wrecks the submarine. The Widdershins and Kit Snicket, who was on the sub at the time, are all tossed into the sea, along with the Quagmires and Hector from the village of Foul Devotees. Then the Great Unknown appears, and all of them apart from Kit disappear, either swallowed up or rescued by that mysterious thing. The way the TV show ends the Quagmires and Widdishan stories gives fans a little more closure, which many have enjoyed, though some prefer a more unfortunate ending like the books. In the TV version of events, when a heavily pregnant Beatrice and her husband Bertrand decide to leave the island, it's because they choose to return home in time for the birth of their first child, Violet, as they realise they can't shelter their family there forever. This is rather different from the books, where the couple are forced to abandon the island after Ishmael arrives and begins spreading fears among the islanders about Beatrice and Bertrand's leadership. Ishmael's background as a founder of VFD and principal of Proof Rock Prep is also new to the series, as in the books, he's simply a former member of VFD and chemistry teacher. These changes were likely made because there's just one episode to wrap up the whole story, and the mutiny against the Baudelaire parents would have needed more build-up to make sense. As for Ishmael's new backstory, well, that's very much in keeping with the TV series, which has been dropping clues and adding intriguing storylines about VFD since the very beginning. Instead of bringing the third and final season to a close with Violet, Klaus, Sonny and baby Beatrice sailing away from the island, leaving their fate ambiguous, as happens in chapter 14 of the last Unfortunate Events book, the Netflix series continues past this point, skipping ahead 10 or so years, and shows Lemony Snicket receiving a letter from his niece Beatrice Baudelaire II and meeting up with her at a soda bar where she tells him what happened to the Baudelaires after they left the island. By continuing the story like this, the TV show is taking a page out of another of Lemony Snicket's books called The Beatrice Letters, which, as well as correspondence between Lemony and the Baudelaire's mother, also contains letters from Kit's daughter Beatrice, asking Lemony for help tracking down Violet, Klaus and Sonny. By the way, I explain a lot more about the TV show's ending, including the Sugar Bowl, VFD, the Schism and much more in my Ending Explained video. You can tap in the top right to watch that or click the link in the video description. Now what did you think of the changes in the TV series? And what are your favourite moments in the show and the books? Let me know in the comments below. If you enjoyed this, smash that subscribe button and notification bell so you don't miss any new videos. Next up, tap left for a full breakdown of season 3 or tap right for another video you're sure to like. Thanks for watching and see you next time, yippee ki movie lovers!